Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Ready, Set, Rise. I'm your host, Michael Ciervo. I'm really excited. Of course, Ready, Set, Rise stands for Real Individuals Sharing Excellence. And when I think about, you know, an individual who has gone through a lot, who uh, has r- achieved excellence, but there's one word that describes my next guest. And if I were to use one word, it would be the word grit. And I just, I just find her uh, such an amazing person. So I'm really excited for this next guest. But you know, let me um, let me introduce my next guest. She was born in Juba, South Sudan. Uh, was raised in a country rifled uh, with civil war, uh, which has seen three civil wars since 1972. She fled South Sudan in 1996 with the belief that she would do great things. And certainly you're going to see in this interview she has done. Uh, since then, she's launched her own company, Naveen Dominic Cosmetics, in 2014. And she's enjoyed national and international attention. Uh, she was nominated for Fashion Industry Professional for Obsidian Awards in 2016 and received Philanthropist of the Year for Vigor Awards International uh, in 2016. And in 2018, a finalist for the Mompreneur Award of Excellence. Uh, Naveen is the first of, of any South Sudanese actress and film producer to be featured in uh, Nigerian Nollywood, which is cool. I want to get to know a little bit more about more of this world. She produced and was starred in a TV series titled It's a Crazy World, and she's been on many um, fashion show scenes across Canada, in Calgary, uh, around the world. She is absolutely an amazing person, and in fact, she's so amazing that she created a project to help um, around 5,000 less fortunate people in Nigeria during uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. She is act- the actress, film producer, entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, super mom extraordinaire, my very, very good friend, Miss uh, Naveen Dominic. I'm so happy that you're here. I am happy to be here. Thank you for having me. You are just uh, a bundle of energy. I've known you for uh, several years, uh, Naveen, and you know, I'm excited for you to be here. And to start off every episode, what we do is we ask our guests, do you have a motto or a quote that you live by today that has helped you in your life? Yes, it is not what you do, but how you do it. Mm, interesting. Okay. Explain why why that's so important to you. I just feel that everybody have a unique power and a lot of people don't realize the power within. Uh, some people think that you have to be an extrovert. You have to have a lot of energy. You have to be like super, super passionate and whatnot to make an impact or to be recognized as powerful. So to me, it's it's just the way you do things, you know, like the way you do it, you're constantly making an impact. Even when you, you're not saying anything, people are constantly watching you and you have the power to empower. So that's why I believe that it's not what you do exactly. It is just the way you do it and how it affects those around you. You know, and Naveen, you certainly, when you do things, you do things with such impact and force and like, I, I, I wonder, and I look at you, I think, where do you get this, this energy? Even when you, let's say, could be super, super tired, you get up, get into character, and, and you're here. So I know that you've been traveling back and forth from uh, Calgary to Vancouver. And like, how's that been going so far? Uh, that has been really something I, I think I'm so blessed because I fly to go to school in Vancouver every single week. And, uh, you know, with the film, every time I'm flying, I don't know what it is. It just does something to me. I feel totally in focus. Maybe when I was younger, I always thought that if you fly in an airplane, you'll be closer to God. Wow. So <laughs> in a very weird way, I just feel like my energy, everything just flows better because nobody can can call me. I can't take care of anyone because I'm in the airplane and I have this period of time to be most productive and just like be in that like isolation and focus. So it has been really amazing. And I'm just like kind of transforming from being more of an author to a screenplay writer because I'm still writing stories. I'm still telling stories, but I just uh, feel that I'm more impactful when I'm able to tell the story visually in our very fast paced digital world right now. And then just flying back and forth to Vancouver has just helped me to just, you know, explore my creativity as a writer and a creator. It's interesting because I knew you not as a writer or creator (laughs) or a film producer. Right. You you were in fashion and in, in, in makeup. So let's before we get into that, let's take a time machine all the way back. You're born in uh, South Sudan, Mm -hmm. raised in North Sudan, right? Yes. And and 
you know, that's an interesting part of the world. I mean, it's it's challenging to say the least. And and oftentimes we're, you know, being born and raised in North America, we don't get exposed to it, it a lot, like that area of the world. Like, paint me a picture. How was it growing up there? Because oh. you eventually left, but how was it? Well, uh, I was born in Juba, South Sudan, and I was born right kind of like in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, my father was a politician and humanitarian, and then he had an appointment for that area. Uh, he had to resign because of like safety reasons and things like that. And this is how we ended up moving to northern Sudan, which is currently known as just Sudan. Uh, and being there is like my first experience with bullying and all of that because the school system was different. When I was in South Sudan, I would wear my hair really short, like a buzz cut. Like I was a hardcore tomboy. You came to my <laughs> yeah. house, you don't know if I was a girl or <laughs> yeah. boy or what, you know. So, But that's because like the focus in South Sudan at the time, um, it's more about for, uh, you know, like children to focus in education, you know, like getting good grades coming home, helping your parents out with chores, like just being a responsible, supportive member of the family. So that's how the, um, I will say the culture was for South Sudan. Then going to North Sudan, it was like my first time seeing fashion because everybody, boy and girl, all look exactly the same. Oh, is it right? Yeah. So when we went to North Sudan, that was also my first experience with or getting to know about Islam. Because uh, the girls were wearing hijab, you know, and I'm coming in there with shorts and stuff. And then they that's when my bullying started because they will call me Mohammed, Mustafa, all these different things and make songs and chase me around. Like, you know, I was just like, what is going on? What is wrong with these people? We're from the same country, you know. And that's where uh, I ended up starting to go to government school because, like, my father, like I said, was a humanitarian. So we were receiving people who were running from the war into our home. So we had to, you know, kind of uh, scale back in our resources to accommodate the need of, you know, friends and family members and even strangers that came to Sudan have nowhere to go and have nobody to care for them because they left everything behind and then just ran and then we'll welcome them. Like the idea of multiculturalism, I did not necessarily learn it here in Canada. I was born with it, you know. It might have not been like we had people from other countries, but it was different tribes, which was kind of different because Sudan is not like very like mixed like that. People stick with their tribes. So in my house, there was like people from different, different tribes that were coming. So we had to scale back. At the beginning, we used to go to like uh, private school. In fact, like English school. But then we had to go to government school and being there, I had to start wearing hijab, which was very different for me. Wow. And then I have to start reciting the Quran because it was part of the curriculum and everybody had to do it regardless of your faith. And that's where I start seeing color and fashion and people looking different. And I start noticing skin tone as well because the Sudanese people in the north are very light in complexion in compared to the South Sudanese people in the south were very dark in complexion. Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of like mind blowing to me. And then people in Northern Sudan are also like into the fashion, which is opposite to the South Sudanese people because we're like very, very serious about, you know, the topics that I had mentioned earlier. And it was just a lot of struggles. And then I moved to Egypt actually before coming to Canada because like our life was in danger. And my father had to um, uh, travel to, you know, like after leaving his appointment because that it was considered something dangerous, you know, and they wanted him to stay in the government. And for different reasons, he wasn't down with that. Mm -hmm. So he started working with United Nations because he was um, helping to provide aid for a lot of Sudanese, South Sudanese people that are coming to the north, running away from the war. So he actually started working in Ghana, in Accra, Ghana. And then we were with my mom back in Sudan. But because of some of these political issues, it put our whole family's life in danger. My mom ended up getting arrested by the South Sudanese security, which is kind of like the FBI here in North America. Wow. And she was put in federal prison and were, were being asked questions about my dad. And it was like he was even actually being accused of treason for no reason mm. because he was not even doing anything like that. But just because of his uh, connection to like um, what we'll call outsiders. My dad spoke 23 different languages 
and he was able to communicate differently, like, uh, you know, like with United Nations and stuff like that. So they were fearful that maybe he's exposing some things mm. about South Sudan to the Western world. So that put our family's life directly in danger. And uh, like they arrested my mom. They wouldn't allow us to leave Sudan because we were supposed to unite with my dad in Ghana. That was the original destination that we were supposed to be as you know refugees at that point basically and uh they gave us a really hard time the government confiscated our passports they wouldn't allow us they cut off our resources and things like that so it was really hard so my dad had to like uh, put all that forward to united nations and explaining everything not just with our family but all these people who were living in our house, you know, and their stories. So my dad became an advocate for that. So to open, like, you know, like that asylum, you know, door for South Sudanese, like basically they're treated differently as well, even though it was the same country before the country was divided. But the South Sudanese people were always treated more like slaves in the north. They're always not given, like, um, you know, better opportunities, and they depended a lot on aid from, you know, foreigners and neighbors and things like that. So because of that situation, like, we were actually in such a difficult situation with that um, security coming to our house. They were going to execute us in our own house wow. because we could not answer the questions that they were asking about my dad, which we honestly didn't know anything about right so after a long story we were able to go to Egypt instead of uh, going to Ghana and that's how we became refugees there and this is how a United Nations was able to give us the asylum that brought our family to Canada and where I am today it's it sounds like such an unreal story Naveen like when you hear that I feel like I'm like reading a movie script because literally to you know in in north america when we say oh i felt like i was gonna die right mm -hmm. like you actually felt like there's li there's fear oh 100 and i was really really young and for us to see a, a truck full of soldiers with guns and everything coming to our house and asking us to come to line up and everything in our own house it is extremely traumatizing you know and it just makes you feel like all you have is God. It, it doesn't matter. There is no justice. Nobody's going to come out there and stick up for you or nobody's going to even care, you know. So it, it, was a, it was a very, very, very scary experience. Wow. You know, you, you mentioned the word uh, slavery, right? Mm -hmm. And I've read articles that in certain areas in the world, you know, Sudan, there was the slavery at one point in time was very uh, prominent there with the wealthy. I don't know if it's still prominent there, but like, is that something that impacts a lot of people? Is that something that scares people? Like, Oh, absolutely. Because everybody is vulnerable to that, especially economically, because like, you know, the ones that are more economically empowered, they will always oppress those. It's, it's like only the strong survive, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this is part of why in my character, I'm always standing up for these injustices that I see wherever because it's not right. And, um, you know, like I've experienced it personally, even within my family that has been put into slavery. That is, uh, like in Darfur, there was a lot of people, even people like George Clooney and Don Cheeto, when they came down to Darfur to deal with the whole genocidal situation, it has become, it's like black against black. And it's really, really deep because like they had to come and help out and free some of these slaves, you know, like, and a lot of the slavery was actually by the Sudanese government. Wow. You know, we had a conversation about slavery at one point in time and, and it usually happens to children. Right. So, I mean, how does this happen? How, how does how does a, a government come in and take a child in the middle of the night? Is this is this real? This stuff really happening? This stuff really does happen. And oh. maybe some of the viewers have heard of the lost boys of South Sudan. And then there's the lost girls of South Sudan. It's where a parent is no longer able to protect their child like the way that they would like to because the government has declared war against children. It is so scary and insane. Who does that, right? And the parents cannot, like, protect 
their children anymore and they ask them to just run you pick a direction and you just run north south east and you just go there and there's a whole bunch of boys like in the community going and they have been subjected to all kinds of like insane survival experiences some of them being eaten by um lions some of them have to drink their own urine to survive and some of them even get caught with some of the other soldiers in the border like especially like in ethiopia Mm -hmm. uh kenya places like that you know this you see a whole bunch of kids running you don't know if that is an attack on this country or what Mm -hmm. and then they become also enslaved there and this is how they become forced into becoming soldiers themselves so you you would see like kids as young as five years old, seven years old, giving guns because you're running. Who's, who's going to look, who's going to ask about you? Who, do, who even knows that you're here? Mm-hmm. So these parents are, you know, letting these kids go because this is the only chance of survival and they're praying. And all they can depend on is God for their kids to, you know, be rescued or to be alive or to survive, you know? You know, it's interesting. As, as a mother of four, mm-hmm. I can't even imagine if you were to think about telling your children to run i I can't even do it like what what goes through a parent's mind when they have to tell their children to run because they can't protect them anymore I, i can't even imagine because i haven't been there i can't even say i understand because i can't even imagine that like as a parent there is nothing i won't do for my kids like it it's i will literally die for them you know but at the same time like uh from you know, some of the stories that I've heard and things like that, just as a parent, like maybe some are even single moms, you're a woman, which is considered vulnerable. So instead of your village getting invaded, you getting raped as a woman in front of your children, in front of all of that, it is better, you know, like these are these hard, hard life, you know, decisions that most of us don't make, but these things happen Mm -hmm. all the time. It's, it's, it's insane, right? But when, when you look at this, this is hard, not necessarily hardened you, but it given it's given you that resilience, that toughness. And you're one of the toughest people I know. We had dinner and you said, if anyone messes with my, my family, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Oh, a hundred percent. I'm, you do, you do not mess with me. No. Right. I, I don't take it. And I stand up for other people because, you know, some people too, like, especially Sudanese people, they're like so, so vulnerable because to me, 99% of South Sudanese, this is not a statistical fact, but I'm just saying from my experience, 99% of South Sudanese community have mental illness. So that's, that's, let's touch on that quickly because that's something that's really important to you. You've been a strong advocate. I remember, I think it was last year, mm-hmm. you did this post yep. and you were in tears and it brought me to tears because to see the pain you were feeling and it was really about your community. Yeah. You, you absolutely, I could see that you love the community and you want the best of the community. What is happening there that needs to be exposed for anyone listening? You know, the South Sudanese community, especially here in Calgary, is really, really, really struggling. And sometimes whenever I get an opportunity to speak to decision makers and things like that, it becomes so hard because like they don't understand these stories and they may think this is something dramatic that, Maybe it's made up, but the truth is, uh, if anybody is to go to uh, the funeral home on the on the southeast, I can't think of its name right now because it's too early. But we have almost every week we have a funeral, a funeral of a young person that passed away from being murdered, and it's it's always put all these negative things on the news, you know, and people don't understand. Then why are these behaviors that are happening? And for me, I took it upon myself, even as my company, to have it as an avenue of support to South Sudanese people. Like at Naveen Dominic Cosmetics, I created a sub-brand called the Juba, you know, where I have like my Juba collection. I have palettes that speaks to the dark skin and all of that. But I use my company a lot of time as a platform to speak about our pain and beauty that is beyond the outside. Mm -hmm. So in Calgary here, like we have constant constant funerals constantly this person passed away this person's like you know like and coming from that background of the war and all that we had to survive yes we may have been quote unquote rescued and we live in canada and this is supposed to be a better place than where we were before however these traumas have not been addressed properly and there is a lot of serious mental health issues that need to be addressed i have spoke about that before in the media and i'm still working on 
raising resources to open a community center in Calgary here to support the South Sudanese youth so they can have an avenue to get the support that they need to get through this difficult time. So things like education, things like youth employment, talent development, and mental health, these are the four core platforms of what I feel that if we are able to adequately provide resources in these areas. South Sudanese people are so intelligent, they're hardworking, and they have dreams, but dreams that they don't believe in because nobody else believes in their dreams or even in them. So I wanted to be that um, champion for my people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to use my company to do that through modeling, by offering modeling opportunities. You know, like every time I do a campaign, uh, I want to give them this opportunity to shine and for them to see who they are and what they're capable to become. Because my company is all about empowerment. Mm -hmm. It's like, and not just the South Sudanese people. It's like for all people. But I like to mix different people. So the South Sudanese youth that I work with can see that some of the struggles that they have is not just them because they're South Sudanese. There is also other people in the community of different races that face the same struggle. And I want to create a collaborative, supportive environment where we can work together to address some of these issues. So how do you how do you find a hope? Because you came from a really difficult situation. You come here, you're escaping a war torn a war torn country and death to see death happening here in North America. It's like, mm -hmm. and you're strong enough just as a person to be able to say, hey, I can make a difference. But there's a lot of people saying, hey, look, I, I left my country to come here and there's death happening around me. It's following me everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. How do you find hope? How do these people find that hope? I have a vision for my people. I'm not trying to sound like Mark, Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, here, please do. We need more of them. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a dream, okay? Mm -hmm. And for my dream, I see my South Sudanese people overcoming their trauma and everything that they have gone through and just unleashing everything and coming out and seeing who they are and maximizing their potential. I just feel like I'm this activator. I'm going to put it like a relaxer. <laughs> and, and black hair, when they straighten their hair out, you have the cream. Mm -hmm. You need that activator to mix it right. so then, you know, the relaxer can straighten out the curl. <laughs> so I'm, I want to be that activator. Mm -hmm. I may not have, like, an abundance of financial resources or things like that to make an impact in a huge way, but I do have a voice, a strong voice, a passion, and an energy, and the will to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And that is where my hope, my energy, my drive, my motivation comes from. And I know when I exhibit that in front of the right people, they're going to do the right thing. Absolutely. You know, and in everyone goes through, goes through trauma and trauma can actually build out the best, you know, bring out the best in people. They say you know, a diamond, a coal under a lot of pressure creates a diamond. And certainly that's what we're seeing, you know. A human form of a diamond. I absolutely see oh, that. I'm, I'm humbled by that. It has walk me through a time that you've you were you didn't feel so brave because because you have so much strength and courage. Like, is there ever a point in time, whether it's in in growing up or in your business career, where you're just like you feel legitimately not as strong and brave, and you got to put on a mask because we tend to do this a lot. I do this all the time. A hundred percent. And I'm a realist. A lot of people who know me, I'm very straightforward. And I'm working on becoming diplomatic, quote unquote. But the truth is, I just say it the way it is. I do go through some struggles, like serious struggles. Like I had struggled with suicide before, like what I had um, suicidal thoughts. I attempted suicide as a teenager when wow. I came to this country before, you know. But then I gave myself permission to be crazy, okay. I'm like, Naveen, you're allowed to. You've gone through a lot. If you want to cry, damn it, go and cry, Right. You know what I'm saying? If you need to just freak out, just do it. You know what I'm saying? And and here in this country or in this society, people always put pressure of this so-called perfection that you have to be this flawless human being. I am by far, 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 far not flawless. Right. I have a lot of issues, but I know I'm not the only person who has a lot of issues. I allow my dream and my vision to pull me from that dark hole and to remind me that there is a sunshine over there. Yes, I'm here right now, and I look at it just like the weather. Today, it's a storm, but 100% the sunshine is going to come sooner or later. But at the same time, I allow myself. 
crying is a form of release. Mm-hmm. And from somebody who has experienced so much pain, like when I cry, man, I cry, I get my ice cream, my cookies, I do what I need to do. F- to full blown. You're full blown. You're fully committed to I'm that cry session. I'm committed to that cry session. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm passionate. And when I'm passionate, it's like, you know, this is my depression moment. I'm going to take it to the fullest and say it all. And in a very weird way, when I'm done eating a tub of ice cream or a whole bag of cookies or whatever, and I have cried my heart out, then my Naveen inside, the rescuer comes as like, okay, so now that we're done, what's next? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And I'm able to champion myself and, and, you know, be my own cheerleader and say, okay, we did what we have to do. We had the right to do it. And we don't care what anybody has to say about it or thinks about it, but we still are on a mission. We still have a job to do. So come on, girl, we can do this. You're your own cheerleader, your pet. A hundred percent. I talk to myself all the time. I don't have full blown conversations with myself, but I sure talk to myself because I have a lot of what I call antagonistic events in life. I just made that up on set. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a word that should be in the dictionary. You know, it's, uh, they said that some of the most intelligent people talk to themselves. Actually, one of my favorite books is, um, it's meditations by Marcus Aurelius. who's an Mm -hmm. amazing philosopher. He was, he was the last of the great emperors. Mm -hmm. And the entire book is just him talking to himself because he doesn't know who to confide in. So he's confiding in his inner self. It's probably one of the best books. It's, it's interesting. Oh, wow. Um, that sounds like me because I really do that. You right. know, I, I go through some points in life sometimes, even kind of like right now, where I feel like I can't trust anybody. Oh, I tough. really, I really feel that way. And growing up in South Sudan, and that's where I came up with my statistic of 99% of the people from South Sudan are crazy or suffer from some type of mental illness because I had these ideas and visions and I felt like I can't trust anybody to share it with them because whether it was even at times my parents, my siblings, my friends, my teachers, they would just, they just couldn't see it. You know what I mean? And then they will just say, you're crazy. So if I wasn't very strong willed, I would have grown up believing that I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. And at some points I really did believe it because I'm just like, if everybody says I'm crazy, maybe I am crazy. But then I said to myself, wait a minute, they're all crazy, not me. You know what I'm saying? So I had to confide in myself. So I had to be like, I have to guard these ideas because I believe these are visions that God gave me. Mm -hmm. And there is a reason why the rest of them can't see it because it was only meant for me to see it. And thank God they think it's crazy because they will not pursue it because it's crazy. Therefore, I can pursue it on my own mm-hmm. without having to have a lot of like uh, competition or a lot of like people standing on my way. And you know what? When I did it, the exact same people who called me crazy and called my ideas crazy turned around and called them brilliant. How about right. that? Yeah, you turn I'm the like, haters into lovers and you believers. Yeah. It's interesting <laughs> because, uh, you know, anyone who's ever made a, a, a meaningful change in the world any visionary, any, you know, uh, any entrepreneur who's done amazing things has, you know, has a bit of craziness in them mm-hmm. because they, they take what is in here that no one else sees and makes it real. So I, I admire you for being crazy because we need more crazy people, people that think outside the box. Mm-hmm. Right? There's an interesting one. You've held so many different hats and even prior to becoming an entrepreneur and philanthropist, I was reading an article and they said that, uh, or you said that you were considering being, uh, when you were younger, considering being a teacher, a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, yep. of course, a <laughs> business person. And you said you most wanted, wanted, mostly wanted to please your father and to make your family proud. Yes. Right. Why, why was that so important to you? Because those were the jobs that were considered that somebody successful. Like when you think of, and it's not actually just South Sudanese people, Africans, I think just maybe people who come from high context culture in general, you know? So if you're a doctor, wow, that's successful. If you're an engineer and all of that stuff, like even you will see people back home, they will always say, this is where my kids should be. And they put that pressure for you to be there. And I'm thinking as an artist, you know what I'm saying? Because I love art, everything art, culinary art, you know, um, interior design, hair, makeup, drawing. I love everything everything, art, dance, whether it's performance art, any Mm -hmm. type of art. I just feel like, you know, maybe because like I come from such a dark background, I want to splash color somewhere. I want to just create something. That's where it came from. But to be an artist is just like considered like, like one of those very low jobs. Like that's what losers do. Mm. You know what I'm saying? 
And I thought to myself, okay, there is a lot of things in me. I did want to be a teacher and all of these things, and I still do. And guess what? I'm still doing it, you know, because every time I'm doing a presentation, I'm a teacher. I educate my clients about my products, so I am teaching and I am presenting. I am still a doctor because, like, I feel like a psychologist at the same time with my clients and the different things that we're doing, like such as right now. I, I feel in my gut right now I'm helping somebody out there right you're now. He, you're healing the pain that your community is feeling. Exactly. You know, and not just my community, other people who can relate to some of the things that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm a product developer, so we're still dealing with chemistry and all of that. So you know what? I am still into that medical field in a way, you know? And I look at myself, I'm definitely also a lawyer because I'm always standing up for the things that I believe in, you know? Mm -hmm. So all of these things that I was passionate about, even with engineering, you know, I'm still engineering something every day. I'm always creating something. So I just feel like these are all maybe things that I saw when I was younger. Those are my micro talents. Mm. But now on a macro level, I know that I can put it all under the umbrella of a philanthropist and entrepreneur. Right. And you're also an author, right? So, yes. you know, there you have this, this great book that talks about your life. It's a, you know, it's, it's really a journey as to how you came to be. The interesting thing is, you launched this book, what, 2018? Yes. So 2018. Beginning. So mm -hmm. beginning of 2018, from then till now, there's other chapters that have evolved in your life that are not captured in the book. But let's just like quickly, in two minutes, just quickly talk about the book because I find it interesting because the title is Beauty from the Ashes of War. Mm -hmm. And we are always in the battlefield, whether we are in the corporate battlefield, at war with our own self, our insecurities, yeah. One thing that you do focus on is empowerment of women. Yes. Why is that so important to you? To me, women are the most vulnerable people, you know, and when you empower a woman, you empower the whole family and you empower the community. You know, uh, it doesn't mean that I don't focus on men, uh, but I just feel that with women, we can get a little bit more, including the men, which is all part of the family unit. And, women for the longest time were considered actually a property, not even humans, you know? Mm -hmm. And until now, there is a lot of that struggle. It seems like everywhere I go, I face some type of a challenge and I feel there is some type of a calling, even with the film industry, you know, and what is going on and being on set and seeing some behaviors that I'm thinking like, oh no, not on my time, of course not. You know, you can't talk to people like that. I don't care. You know, like uh, producers and directors are always, uh, you know, looked at as gods on set and they feel that way and they feel there is a need for them to be jerks to everybody mm. around them just because they hold this, you know, position or whatever. And this is why you see there are unions, you know, in the film industry and all of that. People are trying to be more union actors or union, you know, like just uh, crew members to avoid that, you know, abuse. And at times, you know, you have to shoot overnight. People work like 14 hours, 16 hours, whatever. But you have to give them a day off the next day because you know what I mean? Like, it's still, I'm a huge advocate, you know, of, of course, mental health, as well as, you know, self-care at work, all of that type of stuff. So I constantly feel like, oh, man, this is another cause. It looks like I'm going to be having to raise another flag, you know, like women in film. And we bring in, a huge creative side and soft side. Like even like, you know, with every uh, production that I do, I feel like I'm softening some of these guys and they may be hardening me a little bit in a way, but you can still achieve objectives without having to like have this egotistical attitude about getting it done. It's actually more empowering to me. The least effective, you know, form of power for me is coercion, mm -hmm. you know, like, I'm an inspirational leader, and I, I'm also transactional at the same time. But these transactions that we need to account for or these uh, productive points at the end of the day that we need, it does not have to come with source aggression or abuse, in my opinion. And I will not tolerate it. I don't care for whatever reason. So for women, for <coughs> me... You know, like some of the challenges, like, you know, aside from being even noticed as a uh, producer or somebody who is vital to uh, the family unit or to the work environment and all of that type of stuff, it's like they need to be championed and, and they need to be uh, reminded of their worth. They need to be reminded that 
you're not just good enough. You are more than good enough. You know, like running a family is like running an organization. You have the skills that it takes to do the job. You know what I mean? So I just feel like every client that sits on my chair, I do more than makeup. You know what I mean? I'm able to remind them of how beautiful they are inside and out. I am able to hear some of the stories and encourage them in whichever way that I can. And it's, it's just makes me feel so good and I feel like my company is like really really important it's an essential service that I provide in society right now I I love it you know it's I've always been a fan of supporting women Mm -hmm. Uh, I interviewed Tony McGrath who's the CEO of the Grand Theater and we we had a great conversation about women's empowerment and both him and I agree that I think women make the best leaders, to be honest with you. I think naturally they are used to wearing multiple hats. I think naturally they have this nurturing characteristic and this strength. Mm -hmm. It's funny when when you see baby cubs, like bears, and you say, you don't want to mess around because mama bear is going to come around. They don't never say daddy bear is going to come around. It's like, (laughs) you do not mess with mama bear, Mm -hmm. right? And so I, I, I admire you for championing that because we need more women leaders. Um, Speak of like leadership um, moving forward, are there any leaders that you aspire to or or really look up to? At the moment, there there is a lot of maybe not as popular leaders, but the biggest one for me is my mom. My mom is a very strong leader. My goodness, this woman is like a hundred women in one, you know, like just how she balances everything. I draw a lot of my strength from her and I have seen how she just like handled so many situations that a lot of people would have lost their mind, to be honest, you know? And so she's definitely one person that I look up to a lot. Um, I, I look at people like also like Nelson Mandela, you know, and just for what he believed in and everything that he has gone through. Um, in terms of like women leaders, I look up to people like, of course, Oprah, um, Michelle Obama, you know, um, and also like spiritual leaders like Paula White, you know, like the, these women are able to make life real for me. I, I don't, I'm aller- I always tell people I'm allergic to fake people and fake anything. You right. know what I mean? Like if you're going to tell me something that is raw and real, something I can relate to, something that can speak to my pain, I'm all ears. I'll bring my elephant ears and listen to that, you know? Right. But when people try to do all these pretense and trying to, you know, make like, oh, my life is so perfect and we want to talk about like, oh my God, my diamond ring, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, my husband just bought me this car. Like, these conversations, I, I just like brush right through them and I'm out the right, door. Right. Because, you know, like you don't have to put in a show for me. I'm in film build business, okay? Right. So I, I know drama and all that stuff, you know? But when when I am out of character and I'm talking to the real people and real stories, I want to hear real things, you know, mm-hmm. and that is just kind of like what's big for me. You know, staying on the topic of leadership, about 10 minutes ago, you mentioned uh, you know, the great Martin Luther King, right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, your I had a dream mm-hmm. story. So there's, there's a quote I, I found here and it's, uh, there's no better than, adversity every defeat every heartbreak every loss contains its own seed its own lesson on how to improve your performance next time and that's malcolm x Mm -hmm. right now we're seeing more leaders coming out there and one leader that uh that came out of nowhere that 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 just just blew me away and i was just so so proud was first of all i never talk about religion and politics that's one thing especially on a show i I try not to but i'm gonna break it today okay just for you. I'm going to break it today. <laughs> and, you know, you've empowered so many women of color mm-hmm. right, to, to be strong, to have business, to feel confident in themselves. When you saw Kamala Harris mm-hmm. become the first woman in the second highest position in the White House, not only is she a woman, but she's a woman of color. Mm-hmm. How did you feel? Oh, my goodness. I want to just tattoo her face on my back. (laughs) Right. Really. (laughs) That's what I want to do. But I don't believe in tattoos. But I'm just like people were celebrating her more than even Joe Biden. Let's just put it that way. You know, like women, like I look at Instagram and, and, you know, we've been on set so much for the past like two weeks. And you know that because it has been insane. And every time I pop by Instagram, I, I just scroll. I just see her picture. Every woman is just celebrating her. 
you know, and celebrating just having that representation because we wanted it uh, that in the previous election, Mm -hmm. but that didn't happen for us, you know, and then now this is the next best thing for us, which is the best thing. So, and I like her background that she's not just black, you know what I'm saying? Because like she has the, you know, the East Indian part of her, she has the black part of her, she has the American part of her. Mm -hmm. She's like a multicultural force by herself, you know, and I know that she's going to be bringing so much, you know, like not just to the White House, to the world, Mm -hmm. because every woman is looking. This is an impossible position. You know what I'm saying to get. And so I'm just like so ecstatic about it. You know, growing up as a kid, um, you I I read that uh, you considered actually bleaching your skin. Oh, yes. In 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 uh, Egypt Mm -hmm. because you're being bullied. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And, you know, to go through that, to think because I'm of color, because I'm darker complexion, because I'm different, I might not be good enough. Did you ever think that in your lifetime you would have seen the first black president and the first female visible minority black vice president in your lifetime? Nope. Like, so where do you see the world moving forward? <laughs> if, if this is happening so quickly, mm-hmm. where are we five... In your eyes, in the eyes of Naveen Dominic, where are we five to ten years from now? Is the world a better place? To be honest with you, I, it's not a it's not a crystal clear vision for me. There is part of me that says it will be a better place, but sadly, because of all this police brutality and all these other injustices, like and SARS and all of that. I, I don't know where we're going to stand. I am hopeful that it will be, but I am proud of the, you know, the awakening by society and attention to racism and all this injustice that is happening, you know? And it's actually kind of like uh, an eye opener because I always thought it was just black people were hated from the beginning, you know, were put into slavery. Everywhere we go, we always find hardship, you know, and when people think about committing atrocities, they committed them on black people, you know, when it comes to like, you know, human trafficking, all these other awful things that happen in the world. But with all this stuff that is coming out in the media, you know, and having even like different people other than the black race coming out, like we look at, um, you know, natives coming up and talking about that. Mm-hmm. I look at East Indian people come on. I'm just like, oh my goodness, how, what rock were we under that we have not seen this, you know what I mean? And even even like Caucasian people have gone through that because anybody that uh, speaks about these injustices are viewed the same, you know? Mm. So then this is definitely a mindset thing and it is systemic racism because this is what I've talked about and I try to prove and break that down, you know, in some of my previous like, you know, conversations and things like that. So it's good that there is that awakening. So I believe that in one area that we're heading towards the right direction because we're going to keep these things in check and all these inappropriate behaviors will hopefully be discontinued and then things can move towards a positive route. But then at the same time, I look at all this Again, people who are thinking they're in denial or saying, no, this is not happening. This is what is really going on or whatever. So you just you just never know which direction this might go. But I am definitely watching. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you. There is this systemic racism. My, my sister-in-law is, she's African. Right? Mm-hmm. She's from Somalia. And uh, in our family, we have, you know, my, my brother's, of course, a Filipino and his wife is is black, and they have a beautiful child, and they have two of them, and and you could see what the world can look like if we, if skin doesn't matter, if, if exactly. you don't care, if if you if you love people, right, and and it was hard because of course there was racism, and like two, two completely opposite, like this is you don't see this combination happening that often, That's right? Very true. And she's absolutely stunning, and my, my brother's a, a big guy, tattoos, bald, mm. like just complete, like how did he get her kind of thing, right? <laughs> like she's stunning, she mm-hmm. looks like Iman, like she's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And somehow they made it work, right? And he was telling me that they've experienced so much racism just to be happy. I know. You know, to, and, and, and that's that's sad. You know, speaking of this, there is a couple that has endured a little bit of challenges just to just to be married. And it's in it's in, in the British royal family, right? When you took take a yeah. look at uh, Meghan Markle, right? Yeah. Now here's a girl that 
somehow penetrated mm -hmm. like the whitest of the white mm -hmm. <laughs> like the, yeah. this colonized entire world right and and she's there and she consistently goes through constant racism she was never welcomed mm -hmm. by the royal family or a lot of the people some people like her some people don't mm -hmm. but she continues to put on this great smile mm -hmm. and i was reading an article how a, a, um, a behavior a coach said she's really toughing th like fighting through this like her smile Definitely. is tense mm -hmm. and it's hard for her you being the mentor for so many mm -hmm. people, if if Megan was right here and, and you're in your amazing Naveen Dominic, beautiful <laughs> self, what advice would you give her in such a position of spotlight to keep pushing forward? Keep an eye on the prize. Mm -hmm. That's what I will always say. I experience, not that I'm, you know, comparing myself or anything like that. I experienced that all the time, to be honest, you know, like even say it was in school, you know, or, you know, different things. But I know that I'm a black woman. I know that attacks will come to me. And I know that it's going to be some people, nothing will make them more thrilled than seeing me broken and defeated. Mm -hmm. And they will never see it. Mm -hmm. Not even in their dreams, you know. Right. So I will continue to smile even wider, get more you know, like facials and everything, especially anti-aging, of course, Naveen <laughs> Dominic Cosmetics, <laughs> around here to make yeah. sure my smile is brighter and make sure my teeth is whiter. And I will smile and walk with my head held right up high. Yeah. It takes a, the only person that can truly break you is you mm -hmm. if you allow it to happen. Right. And, and you of all That's people it. have endured some really tough, tough things. Yes. And, and death was actually part of your life. Yeah. you you know, the, the father of your your uh, is your daughter, right? Uh, yes, the father of my children um, passed away, right. and he was murdered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that is actually what pretty much incepted Naveen Dominic Cosmetics in a way because we have talked about that before when he was alive. This was the mm -hmm. the vision that I had. I was going to call it Naveen, Cos Naveen Cosmetics. And I remember in 2008, I was going around doing my primary research for it in Windsor, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I will ask people because I wanted it to know if that is a good name for the brand. And I'll be like, have you heard of uh, Naveen Cosmetics? And honestly, 95% of respondents say yes. Really? And I did 100 people, and I just like, yes, my name is marketable. But <laughs> yeah. then I know why it was marketable, because people hear Nivea, you uh, know, okay. cosmetics, right. and then they think it's Naveen. And I said to myself, all right, that works for me. And that's you your know? world, because you are a marketer. I am a marketer. Because that is your thing. That is, I am a born, bona fide right. marketer. I was born to promote, <laughs> yep, yep. you know what Love I'm saying? It. And uh, for me, I, I like to make informed decisions. Whenever mm -hmm. I come up with my strategies, I don't base them on my feelings. I need to have hard core evidence not just even secondary research i would definitely do even if a little bit of a primary research within my target market and geographic area so then it can kind of confirm for me is like yeah let's do it you mm -hmm. know i see the market there these people at least would buy it wow. so that's kind of how i go with it you know um what keeps you going i mean you got this ball of energy you wear so many different hats you owned uh, correct me if i, I think it was called uh, uh, Af Africana Salon Africana and Beauty Salon Supply. And Beauty Supply. This is yeah. prior to Naveen Dominic. Yes. Um, you create Naveen Dominic. You actually got into the fashion world for quite some time. You had models. Like, you were constantly evolving. One thing, when I first met you, and I use this line all the time, <laughs> and I, I, I give you credit, though, because okay. it inspired <laughs> me to actually want to do more. Mm -hmm. You said, charity or philanthropy, philanthropy is not, is what, not I do, what I do. It's who, it's who I, I am. am. And... It resonated with me because as I'm trying to find my why, I'm trying to find why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You inspired me three years ago, or four, almost four years ago, mm -hmm. to start giving back. Right? Mm -hmm. I have a picture here. I just want to tell you because <laughs> it was uh, the expression on your face okay. just brightens me up so much. And, <laughs> and just tell me what's going on here. Ah, <laughs> this picture is when I used to be, um, I used to own Naveen, I mean, uh, Africana Salon and Beauty Supply. Mm -hmm. And this is, I am not my hair presentation. So I gathered a bunch of women and I wanted it to, um, you know, just kind of do a presentation 
so people can see what this, what, why did I create beauty response to cancer? Like, what's the big deal? You know what I'm saying? Because there are other organizations that do different things. So I wanted it to show them how much I believed in what I'm doing. And I wanted it to show where do clients actually lose their hair. And if you notice in that picture, my eyebrows are also shaved, you know, so it's oh, wow. my hair and my brows. I, I wanted them to see it. I couldn't do the lashes mm -hmm. and I thought that was a bit much too because it can go in my eyes. I know, but I don't know anybody that ever trimmed their eyelashes right off. I thought that was a bit far fetched, but that those are the areas, you know, because like I help with the wigs, I wear wigs. Mm -hmm. I, you know, like with the makeup and all of that, I was teaching um, my clients at the time how to deal with the loss of uh, their eyelashes by putting dots because, you know, like the glue with the adhesive, it's, it's a bit much and it could create a health issue and I didn't want that. So I got a bunch of these women and we all shaved our head at an event live. And I Which is really tough because, you know, women... That it's like Samson and Delilah, you know, Samson, mm -hmm. your, your strength is your hair. That's, yeah. you know, you, you sh to shave that off is extreme vulnerability to many people, but you don't look so vulnerable there. You look that, <laughs> that face just, you know, it brightens me up when I saw it. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta show this. Right. Cause I, I absolutely love it. There's another picture. I just want to know what is going on here. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can pull this. Okay. Here we are. And um, this was an interesting one because there's no caption at all. <laughs> and I just want to know what's going on in your mind here. <laughs> okay, so. Because there's <laughs> nothing. This, this is 20, I don't know, 15 or something like that. Oh, wow. Where did you find But there's picture? no caption there. Usually we do hashtags, caption yeah. is what I'm feeling. You're, like when I saw this, I'm like, she can foresee something in the future. She's looking up like. What is going on in your mind there? <laughs> this picture was actually in Madrid, Spain. Oh, no way. And yeah, I think I was, what was I doing there? I just, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't, I wasn't like thinking of anything. I just thought, oh, it's a good picture. And it's a selfie, but it doesn't look like one. It's, it's such a beautiful picture because when I look at that, I see a strong woman who knows where she's going. Like when I looked at that and... um you know, you, you have this, this smile there. You got this big hair. And then a couple of <laughs> posts later, you shave the head off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm like. Yeah, I, never a dull moment. I, I, lo I loved it. Um, and you know what? I'm just going to steal this opportunity to sure. talk about uh, what I just finished last night and stuff. Yeah, so um, I'm working on a web short. Uh, it's called Going For It. And uh, I have a part where there is baldness and removing of hair. And that's that's all I can say about it. Because I'm going to be working on editing it tonight. And I'll send it to you and get your send feedback. Send it to me. So <laughs> that is actually the next chapter, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you're into film. A hundred percent. Why? Like, you know, you have what? already, other, <laughs> is there something you cannot do? <laughs> like, is there, you could do everything. Like, I'll, I, I'm not trying to be a hundred percent jack of all trades, but I like to learn about everything. And my passion for film, or I should say entertainment started at a young age when I was five, actually, you know, I've always loved, you know, like entertaining people because, mm -hmm. you know, like I just want to make people happy. And I started that when I was five. I used to dance, uh, like, you know, to Sukus music, which is African music. Uh, and mainly it was from, um, uh, what is it called, from Congo. And then I would, whenever people sing and stuff like that, as a young person, I'll get up and dance and people will throw money at me. And I love yeah. that attention, you know. Yeah. And uh, my uncle, um, Andrea, because like in Canada here, Andrea is a girl's name, but back home, it's also a guy's name. And my uncle Andrea would always take videos of me and I just felt like a superstar, you know mm. what I mean? And I thought, oh, wow, you know, and, he, and I was just excited about it. And uh, when I came to Windsor, Ontario, I definitely wanted to be in that whole entertainment, you know, industry. Right. And that's where I was faced with the ugly truth, you know, of producers wanting me to provide extra services for them. Wow. And, and I'm just like... <laughs> And not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they told me that I would never make it if I don't do these type of things. And I, I just took it as a challenge upon myself to show them one day that 
hell, you're going to work for me. Right. Trust me. Not right. only am I going to make it, you are going to work for me. And then I looked at it after going through a few things and I'm just like, okay, maybe I need to put this one on the shelf for now, you know, because I don't have the connections. And there are other girls actually who were doing that. And this is part of uh, the impact I'm trying to make it in the entertainment industry as well. You know, like I remember we're doing the casting and people will send their demo reels. And some people, like, there is a girl that sent me her Instagram page. Instead of sending a headshot, demo reel, and a resume, she sent me her Instagram. And I think she thought I was a guy because, like, apparently, you know, like, Naveen is an East Indian name as mm -hmm. well for men, right? And then I thought to myself, what is this girl thinking? And, like, her Instagram is all, like, just, like, model shots. There is no video that shows her talent. It was just mm. all about her body. I was so confused by that submission, you know what I mean? I almost want to reach out to her, you know what I mean? But then I thought, okay, let me just get my film done first and I will come back to that. So that's kind of when it happened when I was, you know, a teenager. So I put that in the shelf and then I forgot about it and I said, you know what, I'm not doing this, it's not worth it. I, I, I still have dignity and self-respect. I cannot trade that just for a role or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it happened with It's a Crazy World. I was working, of course, as a makeup artist on um, a film here in Calgary, a Nollywood film. And this is where I met Amanda Ebeye and uh, Omoni, who are like, um, you know, like uh, famous um, actors from Nollywood. That's how mm -hmm. I even really got into the Nollywood stuff. And there was some issues that was on set, right? And they wanted it to cancel the scenes for that day i'm just like no no cancel why what are the problems and do you remember i actually contacted you and i told you i was looking for a boardroom board room, yes, yes you remember that yeah, yes of course. so it was that boardroom story because i got it by the way that day yeah exactly. you know i got it exactly the way i thought that you know the vision of the director and it even worked out better because I, I even found actors because the rest of the actors were dismissed for the day. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not going to cancel this. I'm doing it because I've already done the makeup and I don't want to do it again. That mm. was my motivation behind it. But I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to get this done. And I was able to get actors because, you know, I work with a lot of models. I mm -hmm. called them. I'm like, you're coming from work. I know you're in the corporate uh, industry. Please don't go home. Just come the way you are. And I have something I need you to do for me, you know. And I thank God I have people who will show up for me. Mm -hmm. And the director was just blown away by everything. And this is why Amanda is like, Naveen, you are a natural producer. Mm -hmm. I will not do a film without you. Right. I want you to come with me to Nigeria. Wow. And I wasn't even uh, applying for are you Are job. you good friends with Amanda now? Oh, yes. She's a really good friend of mine. Right. So if there was one thing you could say to her right now, what would you tell her? Thank you. Mm. Well, there's a camera you could tell to her. Thank you so much, Amanda, for believing in me and for giving me this opportunity. I owe my film career to you. Well, you know, I think you're going to make her proud. Yeah. We are almost at the end of an hour. <laughs> this flew because I have a ton of questions. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing, Naveen, we're entering something called... The rise round. Okay. And the rise round is very fast. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And these okay. questions are what the entire world wants to know about Naveen Dominic. Oh, wow. And they're very, <laughs> very, very fast questions. So okay. speak from the heart very quickly. Okay. Um, so <laughs> are you ready for it? Ready. All right. Ready, set, go. One, two, three. Let's go. Ready, set, rise. Um, you've always represented strength and have stood up against bullying. In many eyes, the one who stands up to bullying is a hero. Who's your favorite superhero? My mom. Oh, good. If you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Um, lifting. Lifting, like strong things. Like a very strong, like lifting people. Like if I can okay. lift a whole community and fly them from one area to another. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. The word Naveen is a, is a unique name. You actually touched on it. It's actually Indian Sanskrit. Yeah. Or, uh, and the origin is new, fresh, young, bright, mm -hmm. and creative. You're the only Naveen that I know <laughs> in my entire life. Uh, first of all, do you know of anyone else with the name Naveen? Yes, I had two classmates named Naveen in Egypt. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, and so you're starting to get traction as well with this name, this brand, this venture. Um, I was looking, and I combined all of your your, your followers. You have about 75,000 in just, I think it's just Instagram. Your, your two Instagram accounts. Yeah. Do you think at some point in time you could just go with Naveen, like Cher and Prince? Like, do you think you could just be Naveen? Because you're 
I could totally see it, right? Because you're the only one. Right? Um, speak of Prince, is there any any royals you'd ever want to meet in your entire life? Oh, Queen Elizabeth. Mm, she's interesting. Yeah, before while she's still around. Yeah. Right. Okay. In January 1956, Sudan ended its Anglo-Egyptian rule and became a sovereign country. You travel a lot. You spent some time in Egypt uh, and Nigeria. Where's one place in the world that you have not been but would love to expand Naveen Dominic Cosmetics? Mm, have not been. South Africa. Mm, why? Because, the, you know, like South Africa has gone through a lot of like social issues, especially like it addresses the racism, the apartheid. Even I look at how African people came together, like our parents have contributed and paid into assisting with the whole racism in South Africa. And when I see right now some of the things like xenophobic attacks on Africans and stuff like that, it bothers me. I would want Naveen Dominic Cosmetics to be there so then first I can empower that economy and then at the same time I can use my platform to make a change there. Love it. Sudanese culture melds like different behaviors, practices, beliefs in around 570 uh, different ethnic groups, and there's apparently 145 different langu languages there. Um, how many languages do you speak? Sadly, I only speak English and <laughs> Arabic, but I speak 13 different dialogues of Arabic, a oh. little bit of French, and a little bit of Spanish. Oh, no way. If you could learn one language before you die, what's a language you'd learn? Latin. Oh, okay. Very sexy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the Philippines, we eat with our hands, mm -hmm. and, and it's just such a communal thing. And uh, in India, they eat with naan, right? In, in the uh, Car Caribbean countries, they have roti. Mm -hmm. In Sudan, they eat with something called uh, gorasa, or gorasa? Gorasa. Gorasa, which <laughs> is like a spongy pancake, right? Actually, in is Sudan, it? we have like about four different kinds of, um, how do I call it? Like a, like a starch that we eat with it. Gorasa is one of it. Kisra actually is the main Sudanese uh, okay. thing. The gorasa is very similar to the Ethiopian uh, anjera, mm. but ours is not so doughy and not so sour. And then we also eat bread, like a whole lot of bread. That just look at me, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like I eat like uh, loaves of bread and whatnot. And then we have something also we call it asida, which is similar to what Nigerians and Africans call it. Different things like ugali, fufu. Amala and other names. So if you were on a deserted island without utensils, you got to mm -hmm. eat with your hands. Yeah. What food, whether it's Sudanese food or any other bread. food, around, just generic bread around, bread. that's yeah. all you... <laughs> it's the Lord's Prayer. Give us our <laughs> daily bread. <laughs> okay. So you're on the same deserted island mm -hmm. and you're with your kids. Mm -hmm. Which kid, which, which of your children do you think would thrive in this environment? Hadia. Okay, she's resilient. She's an awesome, I would have loved to interview her if she was sitting down because she's such an amazing person. Um, you've been in front of the camera and behind the camera, whether it's fashion, makeup, acting. Name one celebrity that you'd love to have as your ambassador for Naveen Dominic's Cosmetics. Oh, it's an easy one. Alec Weck. Oh, okay. Tell me why. Alec Weck changed my life and many of the South Sudanese girls. And I really want to put an event for her one day once COVID is over, hopefully. Uh, just like an honorary type of an event to just thank her mm. for the impact that she has made on the whole entire world. This girl is a superstar to me. She's like the highest level of all celebrities to me. Wow. Like her story like, you know, is what really made me believe that some of these ideas that everybody called crazy, like she, she probably doesn't even know anything about me, but I, she gave me so much hope and strength. You know what I'm saying? And she showed me that it's possible because she's the first Sudanese girl to walk down a runway or even I should say the first dark girl, you know, she's just so powerful to me. Have you ever reached out to her? I'm working on it. I don't want to just like approach her like anybody because I see her like a super, super, super star and I want to approach her correctly. Mm. So that is definitely down the pipe. It's interesting because she has impacted your life. I'm sure you've impacted so many people who you don't know who they are. They don't know who you are, but you've probably done that with many people. I hope so. I'm sure you have. Um, you have certainly impacted me in so many different ways. If you could have a traditional African dinner with anyone living or dead, who would it be? Nelson Mandela. Mm, yeah, I, I saw that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> He's such an amazing man, just to hear that. Yeah. Uh, so you are, again, you're one of the bravest and most resilient people I know. 
Uh, certainly your entire life is an adventure. <laughs> Lots of ups and downs. And I, I, I don't know if you love adrenaline or this uncertainty. <laughs> I don't know. But if you could try one extreme sport, what would it be? Oh, skydiving. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. You should have sky. You should have uh, uh, cosmetics that can endure skydiving to make you look good. Uh, n- no, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you ever think you're going to have men's cosmetics? Just cause uh, we, the word we Dominic have. is such a good, strong mm-hmm. name, and just we have uh, a skincare for men. Okay, you know, and uh, to me, I look at makeup is there. It's this is similar. You know what I mean in mm-hmm. terms of what what to use. Uh, if you have a beard then you wouldn't put makeup on it. You know what I mean? So right. then it kind of becomes a bit more harsher. You know what I mean? And men do use our makeup, mm. you know, like for film, yeah. you know. So all of our actors usually will use our makeup. That's awesome. You know, every creative, whether you're an artist, an actor, a singer, y- you got to get into flow state. I know that, you know, just get into mental state. What's the song that's in your playlist right now that you're playing constantly on repeat to get you going? <laughs> on repeat oh my goodness i don't have a particular song okay you know um but there's a gospel song mm. that i listen to um it's a south sudanese one like i don't even know you know like can i just can you sing it. it oh my goodness no you didn't <laughs> oh yeah come on you you have all the talent oh okay okay just a little bit well i don't think i have the greatest voice but i will just sing it it's it's it the words it means raise the name of jesus all over sudan Okay. You know, so I I look at it when I get defeated sometimes in certain things. You know, I just I just look into Christ and I say, you know what, God is gonna raise me through it because like right now I feel like totally defeated, and and that's what I like. So it goes like this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's it's it such goes. a nice melody, though, <laughs> right? That's yeah. that's amazing. Mm-hmm. If like you're you're producing films, mm-hmm. if you're if if you're to call your life a film, a movie, what what would it be titled? Oh, I guess just Naveen. Just Naveen. <laughs> just if there's Naveen. a movie right now that's in theaters or just on on tape, what what do you think represents your story? My story is so cyclical and has so many different versions of it it will have to be a a, a tv series <laughs> that <laughs> is called uh um against all odds okay cool i like it if that's actually the name of my doc bio is it against right? all odds love it mm-hmm. w- when's that coming out um so my graduation is going to be in august so i have put august 6 for those who want to mark their calendar Mm -hmm. um is going to be the premiere for all my films that i've done uh in vancouver uh and i'm even like picking up an extra film right now because i just like i'm in the zone if you know what i'm saying and uh one of my classmates is flying down from vancouver to calgary because his family here and we're gonna do a cowboy movie Really? Yeah, because Very I want to show people my my diverse uh, filmmaking abilities. Like, I don't want them to think I'm just going to constantly talk about the same stories. I want to create some films that they will be like, Naveen produced that? <laughs> really? Right, right. Yeah, L- not porn or anything. Yeah, like yeah. That. Okay, you know good, what I'm good. No, no, no. Okay. Anything but that. <laughs> right. So, you know, you've talked about mentorship before, and you've mm-hmm. mentored a lot of people, and in, in, in even in, in previous interviews. Mm-hmm. Let's say, for instance, the 18 version of yourself, or let's say 21-year-old version of you, mm-hmm. gets offered a million dollars, mm-hmm. or the opportunity to work with Oprah, uh, Elon Musk, Bill 100% Gates. 100% the other one. Money is the garbage of the pocket. <laughs> really? You know what I'm saying <laughs> to me? Uh, and it is something that we Sudanese people say as well. And for you to have a mentor, that is just like... It will bring you billions. It's priceless. It, it is priceless. You know what I mean? Like, you just can't even, and even for your mental health, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? So I would always take a good mentor over any amount of money. You know, there's this younger generation, a lot of, some of them, I've asked a the question, they said, I'm going to take the million dollars, and I'm, I'm going to turn that into X amount of dollars myself. They won't be able to. They will blow it up, and they will probably have uh, depression after that because they don't know how they blew up a million dollars. Right, right. They don't know. It's called the lottery syndrome. Yeah. Like, you know, when someone wins a lottery, they're not mentally prepared for the money. And they exactly. Just and all their friends are going to come and take a share. And then at the end of the day, they'll be really upset. You know, you've you've m- constantly pushed yourself in terms of um, 
pushing yourself to the limit and, and seeing what you can do. Why do you think most people are not living up to their potential? I think there is a lot of different factors. I will say that that depends on their upbringing, their belief, their experiences. You know, it's kind of hard. There is no like one answer for everybody because even myself, I am the way I am because of what I've gone through mm -hmm. and the challenges I faced and my attitude and how I overcome it. Mm -hmm. Because there is my brothers, for example, right? We've all born from the same parents, went through pretty much um, similar experiences and were very different. If you had 60 seconds with your 18-year-old self, what would you tell her? Hmm. Believe in yourself mm -hmm. because they're crazy, not you. How are you feeling right now? I feel great. Yeah? Yeah, I feel great because like I, I, I gave myself that advice afterwards because I used to be like a, a, a people's pleaser. You know, I want to please my parents. I want to please this person. And, you know, and at the end of the day, I realized I gotten myself in a lot of trouble. And the really most important person for me to please is me. You know, Naveen, you have so many things going on. What is what's currently happening in your life? I mean, you kind of alluded to it earlier, mm -hmm. but uh, what, what's going on that you're working on that you want all the audience around the world to to, to really know and, and follow you and be excited about? Uh, this one right here. Okay, tell us. Do not unmask for beauty. Mm. So this is a campaign that I'm working on, and we just shot it, uh, part of it, like a, a, a startup of it um, in Vancouver, and I have Nini Amerlees is coming down here tomorrow. So mm -hmm. to kick off this campaign, our designer have already created all of the um, face covering. And right now, during this COVID-19 period, and we have Christmas rolling right around the corner, that type of stuff, that is the urge for social gatherings and things like that. Uh, and it's natural because, you know, we usually get together with our family over the holidays and stuff like that. So I am trying to encourage our community to be more responsible. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, for my industry, is the most affected by COVID-19 uh, policies and protocols because of the wearing of the mask being right in the center of the face. That has uh, put a lot of decline in terms of like for demand and our services and things like that. And there is an option that I am showing which is like, you know, with these face coverings, because you got to wear either a mask or a face covering. And then for the makeup, so then, you know, like people can still take care of themselves because makeup is an essential service still. And you need to have the self-care. You need to boost your confidence. You need to still be you mm. during the pandemic. So this is a high definition anti-fog and it's reusable where you can just like spray alcohol here and then wipe it down and disinfect everything. And we have a lot of really cool designs. Mm -hmm. I was really predominantly targeting brides with this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, like for their wedding, they can still look pretty. You spend a lot of, you know, time on the makeup and preparation. And when people tell a woman, you're beautiful, they are specifically talking about her face not her body, not necessarily even her hair. So when a person is called you're beautiful, as a woman, it is that face and you're spending the time getting all of your facials and everything preparing for your big day. So we have accessorized these with designs to match the bridal gown. So it's really pretty. Love so it. there is an upcoming photo shoot I'm super excited about. And that's what we're going to start working on starting tomorrow. Cool. Love it. Where yeah. can people find you? NaveenDominic.com and of course on Instagram and Facebook at Naveen Dominic Cosmetics. Naveen, it has been an unbelievable quick hour and I'm surprised we got through it in an hour because usually we could go for two hours. Um, you know, we live in a very divisive world. There's a lot of negativity out there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of mental illness going on, especially mm -hmm. during this particular time. Definitely. After hearing your story and sp speaking to you, um, we need more Naveen Dominic in the world, right? Oh, you are certainly a person who exudes the resiliency. And I said, I start off this, this interview saying that you represent grit because most people give up on their dreams and you certainly have not given up on your dream. In fact, you've created other dreams and started <laughs> chasing a hundred different other things. Yes. Um, so I admire you for what you do. I respect everything about you. you. In many ways, you are a mentor to me. And uh, I thank you on behalf of people out there who who need hope and who need people in their life who need authenticity in a world of social media that's completely mm -hmm. fake 
Uh, you are a one of a kind person and thank you so much. God bless you. Thank and you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. I had a blast here. <laughs> like the studio is stunning mm -hmm. and uh, I am humbled for you to select me to be one of your guests. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you. So everybody, if you love what you heard, please, please connect with Naveen Dominic. She is an unbelievable person. Find her on social media, support her in her causes, find her on her website. Um, and do me a favor, if you liked what you heard here today, again, watch this episode, share it with other people, click like, click like and subscribe. Again, we're trying to create a community of amazing people listening to some fantastic speakers. And I guess together we could all rise, uh, uh, you know, as one. So be great, uh, be kind to yourselves, be bold, be brave, and uh, continue to do awesome things. Thank you so much.